All right, so we are going to discuss chapter 6 of uh, this book or in general it, the issue of semantic sensor web. Um, now, as you know, we started out with the web and we could, um, um, we have uh, uh, essentially, you can see here this little green thing here, things are growing. And let's see, we, you know, from that little thing growing, there's a forest, a forest of big data. And you can, we have seen this earlier also in a uh, previous chapter, where you can see the growth of data. And um, in 2008, this time frame here, our ability to store data surpassed uh, the uh, rate at which the new data is or was created. Yes? Richard, can you move that window to the car? And now what's happening here is that um, the rate at which, um, uh, in fact there is one estimate where there is going to be zeta byte of data by 2050, right? Uh, and in particular, um, so in early 2000s or actually mid 2000s, the Social data became one of the more dominant uh, type of data. And now, the sensor data is fast taking over. You'll see some, so what happened, what, what you know, led to a lot of growth? Well, first was this uh, issue, uh, this thing about social data. You can see a whole bunch of stuff. And in a way, and we know that a kind of billion people have, are signing on it. Everybody is looking at it, everybody collecting data. And don't only pay attention to the data that is created by uh, what you see on, let's say, a Facebook page. Imagine all the metadata that is created there. Right? Every click is logged. In fact, uh, if not now, in future, uh, the software is going to log your eye movement. And, um, uh, you know, maybe all the search engine already uh, uh, try and understand um, you know, what part of the pages are you interacting with more, right? So all that data, data gets logged, right? So the amount of data that is collected beneath, underneath that is massive. Now, um, but compared to this data that is collected by the social uh, media, think about the data that is collected by sensors. The bunch of sensors on 737, when it takes flight from one coast to another, creates 240 terabyte of data. So I think it's about three or uh, four, four, four and a half hours of flight, creates 240 terabytes of data. Um, there are many planes, there are many, uh, similarly, there are many, many sensor devices all around the world. How much data they create? Clearly, compared to humans, we create data, you know, it takes a long time for us to type. The amount of uh, bytes it takes to capture the text that we type is, is limited. But if you think about the amount of data that a video camera can generate, far massive, at least in terms of computational uh, storage and such. So, um, how do you uh, then process this data? Yes? Um, Ravishet, so when you talk about the size of the data, in, in one uh, course of the uh, flight, if they cause uh, 200 terabytes? That's a very good question. Uh, so, obviously people are collecting the data because there is some use, right? I mean, the, nobody wants to waste money. <laughs> <laughs> just. Uh, but, but the question is still very good. Uh, first of all, um, there is limited uh, uh, application of that data, right? So, if you, um, um, either a pilot is interested in the data, uh, if the sensors are helping pilot understand 
the wind speed and the um, um, you know anything that may affect their flight plan for example they may be interested or uh, when the flight lands and uh, then the mechanics they go they want to know if there was anything unusual so what would happen is that there is a the interesting thing about and this is a corollary of your question it's a very good question the corollary is that when there is a human sense data, where is the data created by humans? Um, uh, humans, uh, you know, understand certain need or reason to do that, and they even also use their linguistic power. Or uh, when they take photograph, they frame, and they know what is of importance, what object is of importance, right? So there is this semantics, there's this um, contextual uh, information that human uses and collect, you know, represents just the right kind of data uh, and right information, in fact. There's a reason for collecting it, the, there's a right focus on it, there's a right way of conveying it that others can use it. When you tweet something, you obviously want others to read that those tweets and obviously then you are going to do what you can to make that tweet more meaningful, useful to others, right? So, um, uh, but on the other hand, sensors are relatively dumb. Now there can be, you know, they can be somewhat smart, but not as smart as humans. So a typical sensor, uh, you as a human seeing something, can uh, easily throw away a lot of data that your eyes are seeing and only focus on something of interest. While video doesn't know, it's just capturing the entire frame, after frame after frame. So, um, and only some objects are interesting, right? So take the example of um, all the videos that are there uh, on London subway. They are collecting a lot of data. Now take the incidents where um, uh, there was the there were these bomb blasts on London subway, right? And um, I think what, what was it? It was seven nine. It was called or nine eleven. I think that was uh, the London blast. And um, uh, while all that data was collected and stored away on tapes or, or hard drive or wherever, uh, when the blast occurred, it is an excruciatingly difficult job of finding the person of interest, right? Because sensors collect all the data. When the data is collected, you may or may not know what will be of interest to you. And so you store away all the data or, and very little things process. Similarly, the drones that US uh, you know, flies, large majority of the data drones actually collect is not used by anybody unless somebody knows in real time something is happening and trying to do it. They use it the rest of the time. This is the data that is, you know. So, huge amount of sensor data can be generated and the nuggets of information you want from all the data can be very limited. It may be, was there anything unusual? Because most of the data is not interesting. The data w would be interesting in the case of flight only when there was something unusual, for example, about it, right? Or there was something that would uh, give you information about, let's say, maintenance of the aircraft. Right? So um, uh, that is the interesting thing. Of all the data the sensors collect, what is interesting? Okay, now what is happening is this so-called Internet of Things, that all kinds of devices that are talking to Internet, right? So this device, right, this guy talks to Internet in a way, it actually talks to the, wherever I go to my office, it communicates my the USB that is connected to my computer through a hub and then it transfers the data to, uh, 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 through that USB to the application, Fitbit application, it loads up on the portal portal sends me, or I can go to the portal and look at all the health related data, this generates how much, how many steps I walked, that's what you have, or how many, uh, you know, steps I climbed, uh, that is what this one collects, uh, so it, will, it tries to estimate from that the activity level I have, right, and then it sends me email, but I can go on the web and pick it up, right, so this one is a form of internet of things, right, it's collecting data and putting up on the internet is making me available, more and more will be making this available as an API for use by other application. Just yesterday we saw another activity monitor, just little thing that is smaller than your quarter. 
and it can be put anywhere and then it collects similar kind of data and then you put that on a on a mobile phone and it transfers the data to a mobile phone but then the data is on the internet so what, some of them um, uh, are you know our sensors are all wide variety uh, you put the sensors in animal uh, on animals or in animals you put sensors in your feet you can get uh, you know uh, uh, shoes with the sensors built in and they all communicate with the internet so these are things that are connected of in to internet and so these are internet of things right um, these amount and your uh, your cars now all most of the new cars and certainly all the medium to high range <coughs> cars are all uh, uh, all have sensors and now they are talking about the, the car sensors are talking to each other right so uh, clearly there's there are sensors now in many cars that tell you whether you are uh, you know uh, on the road or whether you're sleepy and they are keeping track of the uh, divider lines you uh, know red and uh, so yellow and uh, white lines and, and and they are you know seeing they are also keeping uh, under, they are also trying to sense how far uh, you are keeping with other vehicles and are is a safe distance and all that so it's fuzzy logic built into the cars and they will alert you but then those things are now talking on internet um, uh, your, um, uh, you know, uh, you can buy insurance from certain um, insurance companies. They put, you know, they will give you discount if you put their device on your car, and they collect the data. And data, data goes, you know, some of them are on wide internet, so others are on private. You know, uh, uh, they do not open, but still available to other people. So, compared to one to two billion computers, and uh, Five billion or so mobile phones. There uh, are um, expected to be, uh, there, or there are rather, uh, it is expected that around this time, uh, in 2012 uh, actually, we are expected to be 40 plus billions uh, mobile sensors. Right? And that includes your phone sensors also, but many others. So clearly, all this uh, generates lot of data also this watch for example um, I believe uh, Cori has one of these watch so it collects, uh, collects uh, heart rate uh, accelerometer skin temperature galvanic skin response all these things we can so it can be used to measure stress for example also and there's a sleep monitor again that is collecting the data right and uh, I, this one also collects the data about uh, 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 sleep and you know how many hours and when you are awake and when you are sleeping and so there is this big movement called quantified self where uh, you know basically and then you can read about patients of the future where people are collecting your data of themselves and using applications for uh, to, to improve their own health and fitness and well being. so um, number of things uh, connected to the internet hey, yes now exceeded the number of people and is going to far exceed the number of people we have. So, very related to the question you asked me, the issue is what is interesting here, what is important here, what conveys information that has anything to human decision making, right? You have, a, you have an earth or on earth, you know, we are humans, or we have activities, there's natural phenomena that are occurring all the time, they can be observed by sensors. The sensors then record the observation, so you get what we make, we see as sensor data. That sensor data, in a way, is understood, and that is called perception, making sense of the sensor data, so that helps us understand on in information space uh, what is happening right? our understanding which is an approximate understanding of what is happening in the real world right so you see this important thing right? this is the physical space the world as it is there natural world humans this is information space the data and the understanding of the data So, we want to use, or the semantic sensor web is about using semantic technologies to bridge 
the divide between the real world and the web. So we, in a way, kind of you know talked about sensors all, all around the world, and they are there. One of the things that has happened, and this has happened in almost every information domain, and that is that uh, all the systems, in this case sensor systems or uh, systems that process sensor data, are uh, stove piped. So they kind of talk to only uh, they don't talk to each other very well. At least that is how things start out being until there are standards and reasons for people to coordinate. So my Fitbit data only goes to my own account and apparently Fitbit also analyzes it for its own purpose uh, kind of thing. I am assuming that they are not using any personal data per se in the sense of identifiable data. But they, I am sure, have data say, pers you know, for, me, it, for their system I am a person X uh, and um, uh, that person had so much this kind of activity, right? Most likely, they unless I gave it to them, they don't know my age and all that, so the data has limited utility. Um, my application probably knows my age, and so it can be analyzed in context. But typically, the data, and you start by having a system where one kind of sensor is used to collect the data, and you re write particular application to understand the sensor. So you may have uh, an application that analyzes weather data. But then you're not combining weather data with, let's say, smog data. Right? There is, there may be, really, there is a clear, there is, there is a known relationship between the two, right? But typically, you don't start out building systems that uh, are using data for, of multiple modalities, multiple types. Right? So, um, uh, uh, and what we want to do is, and in what advanced, what we need for advanced application is to set this data free. Free and that um, uh, such that others can find the data, access it, and search for it, then integrate with other kind of data and, and interpret. So, suppose you have a sensor uh, on the road that measures the uh, 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 you know whether the roads are wet or not, right? So, there are you know sensors that routinely measure that. Um, and um, if you are able to uh, combine that with the uh, sensor that um, uh, tells you the underground, te you know, uh, the, 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 the underground uh, uh, temperature, temperature of the earth uh, under the surface, under, then it is possible to better predict whether the road roads will be icy or not, right? So, there are many, many applications where you can do, you can better understand situations or have better situational awareness if you have multiple type of data. So, you need to be able to find the data of different kinds and put them together. Or another thing that, for example, uh, the application, in tra uh, uh, the travel application that, say, Pramod uh, uh, works on, where he uh, looks at both the tra uh, road data, transportation data, and also social data, tweets, to try and understand accident. So sensor data can say there is a slowdown. And there may not be any explanation until you see the tweets from the same general area, which may say, oh, there is a uh, traffic uh, you know, uh, slowdown because of um, accident, or slowdown because cars turn or slowdown because there is a um, you know, uh, big uh, event going on. Right? Uh, there are other ways, maybe the data is on the web, if not tweet, and you combine them and you make better understanding of what's happening. So, uh, how do you find something on the web and how do you find something among the web of sensor data in this particular case? So, uh, there is a uh, standards body, uh, a body called uh, OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium. And um, they are interested in everything to do with, uh, you know, geospatial data and uh, sensors are very critical in that, but, you know, many of the uh, uh, geospatial contexts, so GIS context, for example, uh, geographical information system context. So they started developing uh, a framework for um, services-based infrastructure, ser uh, uh, service-oriented architecture, SOA, in service-based infrastructure. So that uh, sensors can talk, uh, you know, 
you can so they can do these kind of things. You can uh, report um, where the sensors are. You can find out where the sensors are. Right? You can find the location of sensor. You can find out um, all the sensors connected to lab uh, web. You can um, register the metadata of sensor, meaning saying, oh, there is a sensor, and the sensor can report this kind of data. It has this level of fidelity. All that kind of metadata can be registered. So when you're getting data from a sensor, you know what kind of sensor it is, whether uh, you know, data is uh, at the level of granularity that you're interested in, is necessary for implication or not. Those kind of stuff uh, uh, you know, can be made available uh, through this uh, sort of protocols they have. Uh, you can um, uh, read the data the sensors create remotely and uh, you know in some cases you can even collaborate or interact with them remotely. So fundamentally speaking, uh, they have uh, uh, you know a distributed self-describing sensors and uh, related services. They have for example an XML based encoding of all the uh, sensor data. So typically, when you buy a sensor from a vendor, each vendor would have their own format of how the data is represented, right? And um, sometimes uh, um, they don't publish that also. Uh, sometimes they publish it, but then you have to write, you know, how do you, to get the data and segment it and parse it and figure out what, you know, just pick out what you want. If all the data is in XML, at least you have syntactic interoperability that you know that, you know, different segments of the data and then you can easily convert that into semantic uh, form. Um, and um, uh, you can, so, so you can access the observational data, you can see uh, the last point here uh, for evaluated processing in the sensor point and so on and so forth, right? So that is what is called sensor web under under bed. And so they define these four languages called uh, observation measurement language, geography ML, sensor ML, transactional ML, although there has been some change since you have four, now there are actually three. But you, you can see that they represent different aspects of information about the sensor and what the sensor uh, sensors give, right? And provide the way to interact with them and make it somewhat standard. And uh, they have this called, something called this catalog uh, uh, services uh, for the web. And so uh, there you can look at you know, different aspects of the sensor data and sensor uh, interactions. And there is a, an architecture for uh, multiple sensors to do variety of things and multiple services to do these things. There is a catalog service which allows you to discover services, other services into sensors, uh, sensors themselves, providers of the data and so on and so forth. Um, uh, then this one here is uh, that will give you uh, uh, sensor description and their data, and um, you know uh, this is uh, dispatch sensor alerts to registered users. So you can there register. I'm interested in getting an alert if this sensor reports such a data. So there is this place where you can go and put your alert, right? And then this will monitor the data coming from the sensors and alert you when the right time comes. So this is a services oriented infrastructure for uh, uh, sensor, you know, web, it, it's called sensor web available for sensors to coexist and for us to utilize that. Now, uh, all this data that come, you know, they look something like this. So this sensor is reporting all this data um, about different things and and over the period of time and so on and so forth, right? Making sense of, so you have to traditionally make sense of each data source independently on its own, right? So unless you are really, you know, you, unless you become really familiar with how that sensor reports data and all that, it doesn't make too much sense to other people. So, where is the meaning? How do we, you know, make this data a lot more meaningful, much easier to interpret and search? And that, for that, semantic web comes into the picture. So, as we have dealt with other type of data, our strategy is again to annotate this type of data. We talked about annotating, let's say, textual data in the previous classes. Well, we would do this. Roughly the same for sensor data. We will annotate it. Already, 
you remember in one of the earlier class I talked about news ML, which is an XML plus format, right? And you can annotate news ML with regards to, let's say news ML had a location, right? And then I have an ontology or, or, or background knowledge base of geonames or ontology of how the ge geographic locations are organized. So then I, uh, I get something called data and my ontology can also help me understand this is Dayton, Ohio. And I have Springfield. My ontology says there are 13 Springfields in the United States. Tell me which one is this. I can now start to make disambiguation. Right? So, um, uh, uh, or uh, if I just come across, uh, say, uh, 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 Fairbone, um, and then because of the again ontology, I can understand that this is part of Dayton metro area, right? And so it's possibly of interest to somebody interested in things around related to Dayton, assuming it's not about proper city but metro area that you are interested in. Right? So semantics give you a, a whole bunch of um, uh, prop, you know uh, capabilities you want uh, to be able to easily deal with uh, noisy data, better to do better in disambiguation. I just gave you example of disambiguation. Um, deal with the heterogeneity, do better mapping, better integration and such. So um, uh, here is another example why you may want to integrate the data. Okay. Here is the uh, data, high level sensor and it sees some part of the earth. And you see that location here in that place. There is a low level sensor on the road, let's say, and it looks at this, right? It's the same object, but seen differently by different sensors and different at different level of abstractions or, uh, you know, uh, granularity. How would you even answer the question? Suppose I'm, you are given these three things. How do you answer? Is this the same thing object in all the three cases? Is that what is happening at one particular place as seen by multiple sensors? And then other harder question, is there a threat because of whatever you are seeing there? Right? So these are the kind of questions you have to, if you have to answer, you have to do what is called a sensor data fusion, integrate all the sensor data right? and combine with each other. So, um, uh, uh, as an example, here, one thing that will come handy is geospatial semantics. Some way, to be able to map location as is see reported or observed in this device with the location here and the location there. Make sense? So, this is the kind of thing what that happens. Data may come in a low level digital format. With the sensor web enablement, you may get XML kind of format. But then, with the semantic encoding or uh, 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 you know, uh, semantic um, annotation, what you can do is to be able to say that uh, there is some city or that this is a date, this is a time, and the time is described here. And the time format and uh, other aspects of time we discussed in earlier class, you know, uh, uh, mapping the time, also, right? So because you use, for example, a uh, uh, time ontology, you can do better uh, mapping of the time. Uh, not only that, um, the moment you are able to say that this is this time, you can use this kind of semantic framework to more easily ask question before this time, after this time, during this time interval, right? This kind of questions can be better answered once you have done that. So what has happened here? There is some very low level data, there is XML encoding which gives syntactic interoperability and then you are doing semantic interoperability by annotating data with regards to uh, you know, uh, the uh, time here, let's say an example or location here, right? So you see data and you can understand data because in a city, right? And that understanding is uh, made possible because you are 
or using the ontology as a reference that co provides the context for interpretation of the data right yes so how how this uh, semantic sensor data or semantic sensor data annotation is different than the other textual data annotation or social data annotation or other annotation because if we look in here like we have some data coming out from a social network which is a, just merely a string we can get we can parse it and can get a xml out of it and similarly we can apply ontology over it and make a meaning out of that data what eventually came from the social network so okay, so the question is, how uh, is annotation different yeah, uh, for different kinds of data, right? Um, uh, does anybody want to answer the question? I think uh, it's the same, right? At least when we have X XML, it doesn't matter if this XML is coming from which kind of data, right? But we have a different kind of file, for example, we have XML or other file or other file which we have different kind of annotation. Let's say we uh, have for other, yeah, model referencing different Okay, uh, I'm not quite satisfied. It is a sensor, right? Because there's a real object in the world. So it is physical object. And uh, the, the semantic metadata that you have is about like about a time and the location. It is, um, it is, I think that is different from and the specific object that you are, the sensor is observing. So that is totally different from the textual data that you entertain. So. Um. Uh, like the for the sensor data, is the main consumer like another machine or a computer to make the data out of it to act like like with the Fitbit stuff? You know, you you know the raw data isn't useful for me to look at, but like if you look at you know, trends over time or, or like you know your sleep activity overnight, I mean you want to see a graph, something that's meaningful, not like just the raw numbers. Yeah, but okay, but so again, um, doesn't quite answer the question head on. Uh, whether we, I mean, one promise of, so, so you got one thing right here in that one promise of use of semantic web approach is to make data more meaningful to machines. In that sense, and to the extent that you are applying that reasoning, yes, that is fine. Um, on the other hand, uh, just for, just to enable the, most of the time, after all said and done, the end consumer of all this processing is human. When you talk about situational awareness, what's happening out there on the ground, then human needs to make a, a decision. For example, the person flying a drone makes a decision to fire something or uh, you know, in the disaster, somebody needs to make decision on to send a, you know, rescue uh, in a vehicle or something like that, right? So, um, uh, the final consumption is human and um, semantics not only uh, it facilitates the processing of the data to easier to get this perception, to get this abstraction out, get this information at the level that human can make better decisions, and you know, more meaningful decisions, more appropriate decisions. So, um, but let me come to uh, uh, your question, uh, Shannon, and let me ask, answer it. Um, at the end of the day, everything when you represent it in the machine is a syntax, but it becomes semantics because this one refers to something that has a common interpretation. The meaning primarily comes when you say ontology represents meaning. What, 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 what is fundamentally happening that gives the meaning? What, what, what is there in the ontology in the meaning? Not, not the owl syntax. That doesn't have meaning by itself. Well, it has meaning because it, it, to the extent that you can apply some logic based reasoning, that level of possible meaning is there. But the fundamental power comes from the fact that ontology is a commitment. There's people to have shared understanding and interpretation of what is what is modeling the ontology. Second, 
ontology languages are typically going to use standards our kind of thing or concept net other thing or you know topic map or whatever and that there is a common interpretation and that representation form is richer so you can model more things right you have class hierarchies you have constraints you have other things it is not necessarily the the level of richness is still not the level of richness that human brain has about understanding an object but certainly much better than what you might have in an excel syntax and not nothing more so that agreement high level of representation and the associated reasoning that comes with that all that adds to the uh, uh, meaning or or, or the, the the semantics you know as in meaning but the fundamental thing still is in spite given even if you talk about all this machinery about our representation or all the reasoning far more critical thing is still that ontological commitment an agreement the people have say oh we are going to this is the standard way of representing how the sensors are modeled and we all agreed to do that right that is a very important thing uh, we should never forget Rathashi, that, no. that doesn't answer the, the question that he had. He, he asked about like what is the difference. difference between the annotation of sensor and the AutoCAD of data. So we also use uh, ontologies or whatever in the AutoCAD of actual annotation, right? Good. So I'm, 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 uh, you, <laughs> I'm glad you're putting me on the spot here. And I am getting actually through that question. So I am going to answer that. But this is a pretty necessary step to understand. So. Now, the first part of the answer is, to the extent that you are associating meaning through the mechanism of annotating data with a knowledge representation or model or something, there is no difference. That means, from a representational perspective, taking some XML and adding to that some of the tags here additional with links, X link or whatever type of link you put, I can use, it, it, there are variety. The, what would happen is actually when you look at multiple ways, uh, if you look at um, the uh, uh, the report that uh, Corey edited for semantic sensor networking, we looked at multiple uh, uh, frameworks for notation. X-Link is just one of them. Okay, So SA Visual has a different syntax for putting the link in. Right? And uh, uh, other representation, data representation would have different ways to put tag link in right at the end of the day when you put a tag on a picture on Flickr they are also doing a notation right it's a different syntax purpose is the same right to label something and when you use ontology uh, as a framework to, interp com uh, to uh, interpret city in a consistent way you do a better labeling so you remember the presentation given earlier uh, between micro data and micro format and uh, uh, you know more richer format so the the richness of annotation can vary but it that can apply whether that, that those richness, those differences will appear uh, would, would exist whether you're talking about social data or sensor data or uh, uh, textual you know enterprise data so now coming to the real answer the fundamental processes or techniques that you have to use to process any kind of data, the information extraction techniques, they vary. That is a fundamental difference in all of them. Not its eventual representation and tagging as semantic annotation, but how do I know your data you are dealing with is a text, right? If you are dealing with enterprise data, typically, you are going to find text data. But if you are dealing with this data here. How do I know this is data? Right? Yeah. How do I inter how do I integrate this picture with the story? Suppose this was a this is a picture of a suppose this is a uh, you know a road road uh, sorry ca a camera on the road and suppose this recorded a, a, a crash vehicle crash and then um, uh, at it says intersection of um, uh, 375 and 75 exit to you know 375 exit to I-75. There was a crash. Let's say that was uh, and and that there is a sensor there and it recorded that. How do you 
integrate that with the story in Dayton Daily News which says in the story there was a crash at the location. Both are talking about the same event, right? How do you do that, right? And so in this case what would have to happen is that somehow the location of this place will have to be mapped into Dayton, Ohio as in text or as in human mind, right? Human mind will get it from the story by reading Dayton, Ohio. Human mind is not going to get that by just looking at that per se unless he happened to a mental picture of the, where the sensor is or he queries or she queries where the sensor is and gets the coordinate. So what, is, so what do we do in machine terms? We, what we do is that this would have typically uh, information about geolocation but geolocation will be coordinate. So then I will use semantic uh, mapping services like um, uh, you know geonames as an example to take the um, vector or coordinate <laughs> presentation into a location presentation right <coughs> having done that then I am able to take something that is not giving me Dayton Ohio as in text to something that says Dayton Ohio Let me complete this and hold on to your question. Now, think about each of the text. So, in the case of each of the type of data, in the case of, let's start with, uh, uh, let's say, news story, right? So, in the case of a news story, it's primarily text. In the case of, let's say, paper that you publish, it's primarily text. And um, you are trying to do information extraction. Well, what are you going to do? You are going to try and um, uh, do, um, because it is natural language, because it is editor, editorialized or author text, it will have periods. So you can say, oh, this is a sentence. Within the sentence, you will use lexical techniques for capitalization and non-capitalization. You may have techniques, for example, to identify, um, you know, a specific uh, a pattern that will be representative of gene name as an example, right? So you, uh, there are specific uh, algorithms people have developed or techniques people have developed to essentially spot name of a location, right? So I'll just as an example, uh, uh, IBM had a, um, a system called Web Fountain. You know, the idea was that it will process billions of web pages, and ex but what in their architecture what they had was very various miners, specialized miners or meaning piece of software. To which, which is getting all this data, but one is good at looking at name of person, other is good at identifying name of uh, physical location, other is good at identifying something else, stock symbol. You see what I'm saying? So the technique for extracting meaningful entities and relationship. I'm to, I, I talked about entities, but the even more harder thing is identify relationship. In the PDOS project, we are doing triple extraction. That's going to, you know, so they have to identify relationship, right? In a schooner, we had relationships, right? They have to identify. So you would have the algorithms to understand the data and extract from that things of interest to you. That is the information extraction. Now, this I just portrayed to you. Uh, a simplified view of what you do to uh, analyze uh, textual data as in news and such things. Now go to uh, social data. Well, social data is also primarily text, but big difference is, and that is what Mina wrote the whole thesis on, right? User generated content, right? So there, there are uh, certain things that occur a lot more often, and you really have to worry, you really have to uh, uh, pay a lot more attention to. Not that they are the same issues not there in the enterprise data, but the issue becomes a lot more important because of the type of data there is and type of analysis people want to do. So for example, somebody wants to do analysis of uh, social data to talk about movies or music. So when we had to do social data analysis, Mina was working with, for example, IBM folks in the, that what became eventually BBC Sound Index as a product that you know got deployed by IBM at BBC, right? Um, so um, there we wanted to find out the occurrences of all the names of movies or albums. Now, in the case of uh, music, 
we uh, recognize that we need to be able to understand smile. Whether smile is a Lily Allen's track, Lily Allen is a well-known singer, or smile is smile, right? So the point here is that now this kind of analysis is unique to social media. Typically, not that you cannot have the same problem in the you know traditional web data. Yeah, there also the you know somebody can write um, you know nice piece of text and it's hard to distinguish the smile or. But the data, this particular problem is a lot more prevalent and the kind of analysis people want to understand is very pertinent to social data. So this particular information extraction challenge is called cultural entity extraction. Right? So the specific type of things you want to understand from the text, even though this is text, in the social media is different. Also entity extraction problem in social media or microblogs is different and diffi more difficult than uh, standard text, standard text as in blog or, or news item, because um, uh, be uh, because the uh, the text is harder to pass. So part of speech tagging, which is a pre-processing step in information extraction, in more many stand for the standard text, many information extraction takes part of speech tagging. You take Stanford parser and find what this is, there's a verb, and there's a NN, and there's whatever, right? So you, uh, uh, you, you, you what, so, and that, so identifying noun, and then proper noun, and then name of a person or location, that is a strategy that you have worked out for the standard text. Applying that becomes very hard for social media, because um, the, the enough context is not there, the language is much harder to pass. Right? There is no full structure, right? People uh, uh, deliberately, you know, because they have short space, they deliberately not give the uh, verbs or they deliberately, uh, uh, you know, uh, use acronyms, they deliberately use short forms, there is special lingo that they introduce, right? I mean, no, uh, no you are not going to find BRB in your news item, but BRB will be pretty common in your, you know, uh, SMS, for example. Or, or your IM, right? So, 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 or LOL, or whatever those things are. Um, and even in the social media, for example, people would analyze, look out for sp smiley faces and variety of smiley faces to understand the emotion expressed by the tweet. Obviously, you are not going to do that kind of uh, extraction on the traditional text, right? So, the specific and the same goes now for in the sensor data. You're going to have ones and zeros, and those ones and zeros would be say somehow say, oh, these ones and zeros is um, the uh, 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 the um, you know coordinate has x and y. This is the x part of the x y part of the coordinate, and then you have to find the y part. So the representation is very different, and from that represent you're going to get a meaning and a location. That's also a form of information extraction. Suppose I wanted to allot this as a data in city where there was data was not there in data. There's no data that the sensor. This doesn't say data and data in D A Y T O N. It doesn't say that. It there is a coordinate somewhere, right? So then, in that case, um, uh, to map that, it's a, again an aspect of information extraction. In a way, so. Annotation techniques, not 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 the synthet, not the part of how you you know put the annotations in, in in XML, let's say. But how do you understand innately this is you know city and location and such? That aspect of processing is different for each type of data. Right? Yes. Standard and there's some similarity, is, some difference. For everything, the differences is all the pre-processing we do to understand which it's which part of data we want to annotate. That's the difference. Which part of data and even how? What does how it mean? You know, I mean, yeah. when you say when you see, for example, hangover, is it your hangover because you you know had a lot of drinks in the night or hangover the movie, hangover, right? Which movie yeah, it, 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 it,
but in this sensor data i don't think we would have that kind of challenges because this data is like um, kind of perfect data if some sensor is providing you some traffic news you don't really need to pre process that uh, news you just get that okay this is the speed and these are the number of vehicle this is the no 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 quite the contrary sensor data are very noisy and uh, they um, you know there is lot of variability uh, in fact um, uh, you can take two sensors of the say you know and go to the same place and they report uh, temperatures little differently and so there is you know there is a certain level of uncertainty about the data uh, the uh, satellite for example uh, may uh, report something but when you analyze the data you can only um, uh, you know that your analysis technique um, is only um, uh, good to uh, uh, approximate of 10 meters let's say mm. so right there there is a noise if a form as an example also many cases the inbuilt sensors themselves because ultimately many many of the sensors not all but many of the sensor data start out with analog input it thinks to the sensor right and so digitization discretization also introduce a lot of errors so there is lot of challenges of that kind so for example people use um, uh, um, uh, you know triangulation method uh, uh, suppose i want to they, they can say well i can be more reasonably certain about average temperature in this area but precise temperature i can only be sure by One degree, uh, you know, level. I can't be sure at exactly the same degree, plus or minus one degree, right? So there is a there is going to be a lot of variability of that, uh, of, of the reporting, because the inherent limitation of sensors, inherent limitation of interpretation of sensors data, uh, use of analog signals and converting them to digitization, many things of that nature actually have a lot of noises there. But still, uh, text interpretation is much challenging. and the annotation that we are doing in uh yes not it's no not again it's very hard to say yeah, in, in here we we know the kind of the structure of the data in in somehow right it depends on what you are trying to read let's say here i give you this now tell me what kind of vehicle there is in that thing is it a, a jeep uh, wrangler or is it a uh, uh, is it a uh, you know some other you know suv then the the you cannot be sure at all i mean uh, the uh, now the uh, uh, video processing techniques uh, whereby you do object identification and recognition so called object recognition techniques they are not perfect in but fact in, most of them are based on machine learning but in the text you even don't know that's a vehicle or not right in the in the in the text if we have the two vehicle names we even don't know that is some type of vehicle or not right? well at least we know that most it's a vehicle <laughs> uh, yes and no, no, no not necessarily it is a moving object mm -hmm. yeah at least we know that at least we know that the wrong numbers right it's your own numbers see that's the whole point is i or we are in the in the text for example uh you tell me any name of vehicle i would know it i mean i don't know that's the thing i, I know, know it but the machine doesn't know it Oh, machine is not. But you can tell machine. You can actually you can give machine all the possible names, and there's a match, and you have high certainty is the same thing. I think you uh, said there's a proper noun. You know that it is. You know. Uh, it, you know. It's a not noun. It's, it's not a thing for a person. And then you say, well, the uh, uh, you know, from the context, you can say it's very because I think, you. I give you the whole dictionary of all the vehicles. I think if you if you annotate the um, the XML data from sensor network. not very challenging because you have like uh any yeah, data there right but if you want to annotate the perception how we uh, how we perceive the thing what is going on there in the using the ontology that is challenging because because of the uncertainty of the data yeah that is certainly agree that's what so i think it so if you talk about if the numbers right yeah. so let's say uh, some some report it talks about some What's that called? Uh, longitudes. Mm. That number, right? Mm. Uh, when you observe that from a sensor, you you have the prior knowledge. This is this is the longitude mm. data coming from. Yeah, mm. But mm. if you have that in the text, you have no idea what's that, right? Maybe a serial number too. Mm. Right. So that yeah. this triangulation you have to do in the text, right. but not in the sensor. 
Right. In that case, that won't be. It, uh, and and, and um, um, it's possible to argue that um, sensors are typically for a more specialized kind of things. They are, you know, they are observing different yeah, kind of things. Temperature so sensor so. always observes only temperature. So there is no ambiguity that it is what is going to report is temperature. And yes, and so to that level, there is, uh, you know, a uh, uh, certain level of uh, simplicity about sensor data. And yet, uh, there are two levels of issues there. One is that uh, the data that sensor reports are often approximate values to the real world. So it's that part, how, how do you record that aspect and capture that in your understanding that indeed this data is approximate, how much approximate it is. For example, in the, I'll show you uh, sensor ontology, it will, you can say the specification, this sensor will record plus or minus one degree, or plus or minus three degrees. So when you report the data, you get from two different sensors, one is highly precise, one is not that precise. Then you need to have the tolerance of both of them also available to you to be able to make better sense of how do you interpret these things. So uh, there may be challenges like that. Um, the other challenge obviously is when you have to make sense out of the data. Uh, and there, there can be again big challenge. For example, uh, what are you seeing in that? Uh, uh, the you know, the, it, it's a drone uh, has six degrees of movements, and uh, all that have to be recorded and then used into the processing to make sure you really get uh, better uh, right image processing with the help of uh, uh, normalization uh, that you have to do. And so there is a lot of processing to be done. And after that, also your understanding of what does it mean? What does it represent? What object it is, for example, that is very approximate. Right? So suppose uh, so you have uh, something that is trying to look out for, let's say, a uh, uh, road bomb, uh, you know, the, the IED the, uh, device, let's say. Um, the, is, is a, you can't say, sensors are not able to say it with any certainty. So it requires human to in, be interpreted in some cases, you know, they use um, time and uh, other event in the same location, many other things before they can get to the sense. So, and then when you are trying to get to the understanding of what the sensor data is, there's a lot of problems. So, uh, a pyramid kind of stuff here would be that you have raw sensor or phenomenological data, your feature metadata, entity metadata, and ontological metadata. So, this would be called in our data information knowledge, uh, this kind of thing. So um, here you start with an example of binary images, streaming video and all that, that is raw sensor data. Then you have lines, colors and textures. That gives you a feature. Then you have objects and events such as cars driving. That is the example of entity. And then you have situations such as cars is speeding. Right? Or uh, you know, or, or driving dangerously, that is uh, you know really an understanding, the ontological meaning level. Kind of stuff. So um, uh, uh, you know, here is a sort of a, what you call semantic sensor uh, uh, data related architecture. You start with you know again raw phenomenal data, right? So sensor data. You from that extract these features and entity. So now. To give you, for, you know, come back to your questions you ask and all that. It's not simply um, a matter of taking these raw numbers and say I understand that. Actually, what you are trying to do. So, so some sample may be very simple. So that you, you so you know, observation the service you made that is simple that applies only to very simple sensor. Suppose you are taking a geographical survey by sending, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a aerial aerial vehicle and it's taking images and from that you need to understand that this is the boundary of first of all this is a boundary and the boundary is separates the field or it is a boundary as in boundary of a, uh, a river bank understanding the distinctions of all these this is a road this is a field separation this is a uh, you know a water body and there is boundary these are the things that you are trying to do here right and uh, that is not easy at all, very hard uh, subject. So, uh, you know, uh, now what happened is that um, 
uh, in 2008-2009 frame, uh, we built the uh, you know one of the earliest, maybe the earliest semantic sensor web prototype. Uh, so I think we wrote the first paper on semantic sensor web, and um, uh, this is the architecture of the early system that we built. So the architecture is that you have data, and see these are the sensor web enablement uh, related um, uh, specification, and that dash s means semantic variants of that, meaning the languages enhance with semantic annotations. And then from that you, data, you can convert them into RDF, so that you can store it into an RDF database. You can also have some background knowledge and ontologies and do the annotation. So you have basic, uh, you know, uh, low level, uh, you know, basic syntactic level enhancement along with ontologies that give you more better interpretation ability. Right? Time and location, many other things like that. And then that allows you to do reasoning. Um, then you have some application or some human need. They formulate a query and this there is a query that is sent and there is, is a uh, open source infrastructure for um, you know processing sensitive data that was enhanced with semantic security to be able to use part of queries. And so you you know so basically you're getting metadata, data and metadata all this way, and you are doing query, semantic querying from here. And then you're getting the data back. Now, um, there are all these sensors out there, and um, uh, uh, how do you even describe what the sensors are, what they do, what are their tolerances, all kinds of different things. What can they measure? How well they can measure? How long their batteries will last? All these questions are there, right? You need to be able to present that. What kind of data it will report? What is the format of data representation? For that purpose, there were people who started to build ontologies, but there were multiple ontologies, and so um, I uh, initiated with uh, somebody else in uh, Australia. Uh, we, uh, we are, uh, as you know, we are a member of Oliver Consortium. So as a member, we uh, initiated a group uh, called Semantic Sensor Networking. And the group uh, undertook two activities. One is to define this ontology, I'll talk about it briefly, and another is to say how to do annotation. So, you know, specific uh, recommendation for doing annotation. So, we ended up basically uh, creating, so there were 15, 20 uh, organizations worldwide, and uh, there will be weekly calls and all that. So, this is how standards activity happen, and um, that ended up designing this ontology. So, the fundamental thing that you are trying to model in the ontology is that there is a particular that relates, a stimulus relates to that particular, a sensor observes the stimulus and produces observation, which can act also as a, uh, in observation, stimulus can also act as a simulation. And so, from something you get time, location, symbol, distance, things of that nature. Right? This is the inherent uh, you know, modeling for sensor in your data. So, the fundamental part of the sensor modeling here is captured in this part of the ontology. Uh, I'll see, show you some details a little bit later on. There are other things you have to be representing, say measuring capability, constraints uh, that, that may be imposed either on use of sensors or many other things. The process that sensors uh, utilize uh, and are part of, uh, the device descriptions, physical device in the description, uh, sensors are often part of platforms and they are deployed somewhere and they are part of bigger systems. And say, like say, the sensors can be deployed in certain area or not certain area, otherwise they will work or not work and that kind of stuff, or work well. So, all these variety of things have to be modeled and which is what, so if you go down further, there are all these different classes you can see uh, in the sensing device. Sensor is a sensing device, is a device, is a part of a system. Observation, right? So, uh, and uh, you know, measurement capability, right? So, there are all these different things and relationships you can see that, uh, you know, is the ontology, right? And uh, with this ontology, because it is developed by this, you know, community, 
uh, now it is very widely adopted worldwide. So a lot of people are using this ontology as uh, the way of describing sensors. How hard is it was to come to a common agreement uh, it is always a process, so um, uh, um, any of this process is um, it's a human process and so in part it relates to and depends on leadership, in part making sure that everybody feels that they have a voice, right? Uh, so, so on one hand the person, people, there should be some people who have, have leadership, there will be some people who are authoritative, they are really knowledgeable and there should be still uh, uh, ability to do a lot of listening and letting everybody speak. So there is that thing that uh, process and good leaders have that ability. So we, tell, we had good leaders and uh, the process worked very well but it took one and a half years. Almost weekly calls, and some people, some people, you know, had kind of had leadership and started the things up, and then gave it to Corey, and Corey <laughs> really did all the nitty-gritty work. So that's how I felt. And the same thing was it uh, in Australia. Our another uh, uh, Noesis was a key organization, but also uh, uh, a very key organization where which also was co-founding member uh, was uh, uh, a CSIRO in Australia and they spent a lot, lot of time, perhaps a little more than us, but we were you know, the top two and then some people including Dairy and many other people were there. So you can see the list in the world. Do you now, see any work that uh, any people who don't want to commit to the strategy they are going to try to do something more in the sensor? No, not in our sort of broader things in the World Wide Web community. I'm sure even before we started, because there were already other ontologies, and we have survey paper on other ontology. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you can see on our website, Noesis Library, you see survey paper on special ontologies, and why we incorporate much of the good ideas from everything into this one. So uh, I have not kept too much track, and I don't know of any major effort that is not using this, but there's always possibility, and if some. You give somebody enough money to do things on their own, they will do it and not, you know, you reuse what is. You don't give them enough money, they will reuse what is there. Because that is just a recommendation, right? It's not like your It's not even a recommendation. This is just a submission. report. Uh, we did not go through the, uh, you know, recommendation process per se. But it is as good as, um, you know, de facto kind of thing. There's nothing else out there. So, so this is widely used now. There are a lot of prototypes that already exist. And real systems in there. So this is an example of weather station, right? Temperature minimum value, temperature maximum value. So there are many things. You just get a sense if you look at this and look at you know find some time and look at it carefully the slides. There's so many things that you have to model in this case. Weather. Now, once you have. Uh, done the um, uh, you know uh, or you see ontology and then you have data then you do a notation and here you know we propose x link based notation right using the x link in the description that is part of W3C specification as a thing but there are multiple of their possibilities so we looked at number of them and we looked at pros and cons of variety of things so in this case because what are you doing? You are linking some data element with ontology color element, right? Basically, that's what, what fundamentally the thing is about. Right? There is a, you know, this thing about time interval, right? That is what you are connecting that thing to. So, this is this slide that says about adoption, the number of projects that have already used this uh, framework. You can see number of things. This is our stuff, obviously, but a number of people, uh, you know, have used. This is some small sample. We had a work, we had a couple of workshops after this thing was done, and uh, um, uh, so here, you know, in the but this particular use case, your sensor 
device selection and discovery. Um, okay, so here is one use case whereby what we did was we took a lot of data. So you see link distance data from noises. We took a lot of data from um, weather sensors and published as a link open data. So I think this was 1.7 billion triples and one of the largest early uh, you know, uh, thing like that. And that, of course, this can grow as much as we want, but that's all we want. This another one also by noise, by the way. This also by noise is talked of in the link open data. Now, this there's one very important one called link uh, uh, geonames. So, uh, you know, uh, device location connected to, let's say, geoname would be very valuable. So, here's a weather station, and that weather station's coordinate is used to map into geonames, so you know. You can ask questions. Tell me all the weather stations in Fairborn. Tell me all the weather stations along this road. These kind of questions you want to be able to ask. Now, if you think about it, this, without using semantic framework, answering this kind of question would be very hard, very time consuming. Right? So, um, uh, here is the example of the observation, link observation data that we created. You can see uh, a variety of events. These are hurricanes and a blizzard, right? And that, um, uh, so type of the event, the date range for which there, the number of triples we had, the number of observations that they model. And you can see the observation types that we have modeled, model and so on and so forth. So the you know, system look like this. You had variety of observations. You had variety of sensors, right? So, for example, a mesovest aggregates data from twenty thousand plus uh, sensors, right? And you have variety of the, you have this all these locations to which you can map them to. So, Dayton Airport is a location where there is a weather station. So, I can collect the data, store that them in RDF or some similar uh, you know, formats and uh, you know, link them to geo names for example and uh, we give you the semantic search capability uh, to uh, get sensor data. So here in this case I can start typing a name and based on the name I the system will map it to particular locations, show those locations on the map, and allow you the ability to directly access the data that thing is reporting in real time, or historically, depending either way. Now the challenging and interesting thing, and this is unique thing that we do at Noises, for example, is to convert the sensor data into abstraction, something that is meaningful. So you get all these temperatures and you have all the numbers coming from many places and you want to understand what kind of weather it is. Is, the, is it uh, you know, raining hard? Uh, is it icy road conditions? Is it a blizzard? This kind of stuff is what you are interested in as a human, not a particular temperature typically. You're going to, let's say, go home um, uh, and, you're going to, uh, and you want to just have a sense of what weather it is. Typically, uh, it is important to know oh, it's raining outside or it is uh, cold. Uh, it will, even if if you were told it is 32 degrees, um, what really matters to you is is it cold enough for you to put a jacket on or not? That's a fundamental issue, right? That's why the meaning is very important. So we had a variety of application where we took semantic sensor network and this semantic perception framework, which I'm not discussing today, uh, but to you know really uh, to apply in weather, rescue, healthcare kind of cases. So um, what happens then is that you have a lot of raw data, but you are interested in abstractions. So compared to all the raw data, the number of abstractions are very few, and it's, so it is much easier for humans to consume. and make sense out of it and make the decisions and so on and so forth. This is a system where 
on a uh, uh, mobile platform, we mounted different sensors. And the sensors, you know, so there was a carbon monoxide sensor, a location related thing, uh, uh, the uh, nitrogen sensor, and things of that nature. And then when this um, device would, you know, we'll, we'll take it, you know, uh, it's like a robot, so we'll take it near a fire and then it will, you know, be measuring various things and then it will have algorithms to use the data to tell you what kind of fire it is. Is it a wood fire, candle fire, uh, chemical fire, all that kind of stuff. Now that, you know, so each fire has different features and feel, you know, so, you know, some produce more nitrogen, some produce more carbon, carbon dioxide, monoxide, some um, you know, uh, have more light versus, uh, you know, sometimes run at higher temperature. All these allow you to then decide what kind of fire there is. So you can do that kind of reasoning of that. And all that processing, is that is what is important, and that is what semantics makes it easier. Mobile MD, here is an application where um, in the application running on mobile phone allows you to essentially um, collect data from multiple sensors uh, your um, uh, weight scale, your blood pressure, you know, uh, as well as your heart rate monitor, uh, and um, uh, this data can be collected, and uh, then um, uh, you use uh, the background knowledge, uh, ontology for cardiology, try and try to understand the risk level for these patients. So the application is to reduce readmission of car uh, patients with chronic heart disease. This is an application, this is a problem that costs $17 billion per year to US healthcare system. Okay. And uh, so if it can be reduced, you can see a lot of money, but also you can uh, improve uh, human health. Going to hospital, you know, is big pain or if anybody has, uh, you know, any experience with that. So. So uh, you can, you know, observe symptoms like abnormal heart rate, you know, but then you want to understand possible explanation from that. I think this is the kind of stuff now you can tie together this with the kind of thing that Sujan talked about. And you can see the processing that happens uh, in that particular block And the system, using this background knowledge base, you can also formulate questions the more contextually relevant question you can ask human about what he or she feels and that can help you, you know, so in one case, oh, we just found out that something is not, patient is not feeling very well, but you found out that there is a, oh, the patient forgot to take the medicine. All right, so with that then, uh, this is a nice uh, little thing, in the next century, Planet Earth will don an electronic skin and use the internet as a scaffold to support and transmit its sensations. This skin is already being stitched together. It consists of millions of embedded electronic measuring devices. Well, that's happening now. That was in 1999. It's already happening and in fast and furious manner. Right? So, um, I know some of you are looking at watch, so we'll end here, but we'll continue with questions if you have after this and those who need to leave can leave.